Hey, hey, Mystic Magic fans, we are in for a fun episode today because today my guest is my friend, Glodine Champion. Glodine is a leadership development coach, a DEI facilitator coach, and she has expertise in process improvement, change management, information technology, and group facilitation. So she's multi-talented. As a DEI facilitator, she coaches teams through difficult race-based conversations by creating a safe space that fosters open dialogue and a willingness to learn. The framework that she uses for teamwork. She thinks the problem isn't that people can't work together in harmony, it's that they are so afraid to ask questions or say the wrong thing that they shut down any dialogue that creates discomfort, which makes it almost impossible to relate authentically. And it's in the authenticity that the magic happens. She's a Six Sigma black belt. She has led process improvement initiatives that not only improved efficiency and productivity in business processes, but also transformed the people in the process. And so the results have pro produced stronger relationships between coworkers and business units and has built trust in the leaders. She helps her clients fill the gap between where they are and where they wanna be. And she uses a variety of coaching methodologies and tools to guide them through identifying where the growth is desired and where the potential roadblocks and triggers exist. Glodine is a coach, she's a speaker, an author, a publisher, a blogger, and so much more. Well, of course, she's multidimensional and fabulous because she's my friend. Welcome, <laughs> Glodine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I, um, I want to talk about your book today, Salmon Croquettes. I want to talk about a lot of stuff, all things Glodine. Um, first of all. Uh, let's let's start with the book because, you know, I you know I know the book's been in the making for a very long time, and that it finally presented itself. I can hold it up too. You don't have to hold it up. I've got it right here. But um, you know, this book is called a novel, but there's a lot of autobiographical content in it. Tell us about your process and what you want people to get from the book. So the idea came because I was in school with girls who couldn't be fully out. Like they were out at school and then they had to kind of tone it down when they went home. And this was in the 2000s. So I thought, what if I create a character that people can connect with? Like a young girl, a 12 year old that can't be blamed for, you know, being influenced some other kind of way. Um, so when I started writing her, she has nothing to do with me. Like the only thing I've struggled with is my weight. However, <laughs> um, there are some things that she does in the book that I did, um, when I was growing up, um, like she shaved her eyebrows off <laughs> to, uh, to rid herself of, um, why the kids may have called her a bull dagger. Uh, I felt like she needed to be someone that people could relate to and also someone that people wanted to protect. And the reviews that I've been getting so far, I seem to have accomplished that mission quite well. People get very protective of her, especially because of her relationship with her mother. So um, I'm taking it that some of the relationships that she has with her mother are like the relationship that you has with your mother. Not even close. My mother wasn't like Not that. even close. My mother was okay. Like my mother, okay. my mother was a strict disciplinarian, but she wasn't, she wasn't mean. Like Zora is mean. And she's mean because she wants Zayla to be like her. My mother didn't want me to be like her, which is one of the things I love. Um, because she adopted me and she accepted the package that she got. She never tried to change who I am. She controlled my behavior though. She really controlled my behavior. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, no, there is me. So you have this this wonderful book that also includes a recipe for making salmon croquettes. Mm -hmm. What inspired you to do that? Well, because my mom passed in 96 and 
um, of all the people in the world that I would have wanted to be here with me when I launched the book was her. And so I thought, as I was writing the book, I was like, what is one thing that I can do to like bring my mom into the story and have that connection so that whenever I think of it, I think of her. And so salmon croquettes was like a staple in our house and she made them on a lot of Fridays. For a long time, I thought we were Catholic. Nope, not Catholic. <laughs> um, but we had we had fish on Friday and salmon croquettes were, you know, with spaghetti sometimes or other things. So I wanted to keep that recipe, although I've tweaked it over the years. It's really her recipe. Um, they taste, my croquettes taste just like my mom's croquettes. So I understand you're doing book readings and you're also cooking salmon croquettes at these book readings. That's very unorthodox. So tell me how that's working out. I am. And I'm loving it. People are loving it. Um, I have two, three uh, scheduled between, between now and the end of November, which I'm really excited about. I go to people's homes. It, you know, it's a small crowd um, because I'm not trying to cook for a hundred people. But it's usually 20 people or less. And I make um, croquettes, greens, um, cornbread, and coleslaw. And the last one I did, they wanted black eyed peas. So I made black eyed peas out the can. <laughs> okay, well, you're making our guests hungry. Well, up until you said out the can, and then they right. were like uh, exactly. underwhelmed, right? <laughs> But um, listen, you, you got a background as an educator. I remember for a time that you were doing some teaching in Chicago. Uh, what brought you into the, the whole education field? I know you're doing workshops and, and classes and, and webinars and stuff. What, what made you want to be an educator? Um, I quit my corporate middle manager, six figure job. And I'm only saying that because my mom, my aunt told me I wouldn't make any money if I didn't get a degree. And I got to that point and then I quit so I could go get my degree. So I got my undergrad in um, English lit and I got my, my master's in writing and everybody kept saying, so what are you going to do with that? Teach? And I was like, I don't want to teach. And then what happened? I got somebody sent me to the teaching credential program because I did a workshop in one of my classes and they were like, you should be a teacher. So I'm, I'm going to say that I just went where spirit led me because that's the thing that I feel I'm most connected with is teaching. I love teaching. Like I miss being in the classroom, but I love teaching people other ways. So what do you like to teach? Um, I love teaching writing. I love teaching, especially teaching history. In fact, one of the best classes I ever taught was a um, Harlem Renaissance class at Columbia College. And that was my favorite class because I got to teach history and I got to teach literature and I got to teach black culture. Um, and I used history to help the students understand that the black, the artists of the black arts movement um, during the Harlem Renaissance rather used a lot of uh, imagery from ancient Kemet. And so I wanted them to understand how we're related to Egypt and that it's not the Middle East, that it's actually in Africa and the people look like us during that time. Right. It's so interesting how many people are confused by that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so like anyway. The top half of a continent be the Middle <laughs> East and the rest of it is sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. <laughs> well, that's why we need educators, right? Right, exactly. So you've also been doing some personal growth and leadership development coaching. Is that an outspring from your educator or what's the connection there? What drove you to want to be a personal development coach? Um, I'm going to say that I was led here by force. <laughs> I'm kidding, but I'm serious. Um, Okay. Well, I mean, is the four spirit or the force of spirit? A, uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, right after George Floyd died, I didn't know what was going on because I don't, I don't watch the news by choice. And um, my cousin sent me a text and said that they were rioting in her neighborhood, and she was astounded that I didn't know why. So she made me go look up George Floyd, and then I found out about Ahmad Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, and I was like, "What is going on?" And so I said, what's the one thing I can do to help? Because I felt like I 
let my community down. Like when I was in Chicago, I was more active in the black community than I am. I live in Monterey. So the ghosts dust up the black community so I can be there for them. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, but <clears throat> I thought, well, the one thing I can do is give love, be love, teach love. So I was like walking around like a crazy, I'm, I don't think people thought I was crazy, but I was walking around Monterey telling people I love them and I want the best for them and doing the pay it forward in the Starbucks line or going into the local deli and buying people's um, lunch. And then that little God voice said, now, in order to do this, you got to be able to love you. And if you had to ask yourself, do you love you? What would you say? And I was like, eh, yeah, kind of, not really. So that, this, that personal growth work came from kind of all the work that I've been doing. You know, like kind of once I got into spirituality and understood that my connection with God wasn't the training that I got in um, organized religion. Uh, this part of the, this phase of my personal growth was really more about looking at inward and really being able to stand in the mirror and say, I love you and I'm gonna protect you and I'm gonna take better care of you. And once I did that, I was like, you know what? I know I'm not the only person that like gets to a certain point where we lose ourselves we give ourselves to relationships or we give ourselves to our jobs and we forget who we are inside. So everything that I did to get myself together, I wrote it down. Um, and I just started using it with other people because once I started posting stuff on social media, people would reach out and ask me how I lost weight or how I find time to cook. And um, I would just tell them what I did and it would work. And I was like, okay, I should do this. But I, I, I ran away from it for a long time because it felt like that and the diversity and equity stuff felt like it was too big and there were so many people doing it. So why me? Um, I finally I will say that the universe took all my safety nets away so I didn't have a choice <laughs> to do the thing I was led to do. And the minute I finally released all of it, oh my God. Uh, everything changed. Like I have way more coaching clients than I have before. All this all happened in the last few months. So yeah, I'm excited now. <laughs> okay. I'm going to pause for just a second. So what led you to spirituality? You mentioned that you had um, moved into spirituality as part of your process to this new phase of your life. Um, I grew up in the, in the church and um, let's just say that the things that I was being told to do, the people that were telling me to do it were kind of being hypocrites. And, um, you know, I was one of those kids that if you told me to do something, you needed to explain to me why I should do it. And if you went to the extent of explaining to me why I should do it, and you're telling me that it's important, and I'm looking at you as my leader, then I'm expecting you to do it as well. And I just, I saw so much hypocrisy. I was like, <clears throat> by the time I moved up to Oakland in 91, I was pretty much done with the church. But then I went back to church. And so I'm just going to say several ministers hit on me, not just in Oakland, but just kind of over the course of my time in the church. And the last minister that hit on me, I was like, that's it, I'm done. And I told a friend of mine and she said I should go to the um, Center for Spiritual Living in Oakland with her. And I went and you know, Reverend Joan, um, she was, she was she like, was like, that was my transformational moment. One Sunday at that center. And I was like, this is where I, this is where I'm supposed to be because this makes sense to me. And nobody's telling me that if I, you know, if I want to do something that I'm going to go to hell for doing it, you know? So the, the difference in recognizing my connection to God and the universe as, and, you know, and other people, right. Um, started to make a, a, a big change in the way I move through the world. Great. Now, you know, you usually don't find a creative being also being somebody who deals with science. And, you know, um, 
So you've got that left brain, right brain thing going on. And, you know, you told me you had the Six Sigma Black Belt, you know, certification and that it, you know, was supposed to be a big deal. I mean, I, you know, I don't know what our audience knows about that. Why don't you explain what that is to our audience? <laughs> okay, so I'll explain it. Um, there's two really three aspects of Six Sigma. There's the there's Six Sigma, which is a um, I'm going to say it's a pro, it's a quality and process improvement methodology, um, and it eliminates variation in a manual process, which is why computers and airplanes and cars can all be um, I'm going to say, basically, you can think about it where um, things that are built on an assembly line, if they're done using the Six Sigma methodology, then there's a 99.99997, I think I might have put one extra nine in there, uh, percent chance that there will be no defects, which means 0.0003 percent chance of defects. One million planes, maybe three, have defects. Um, in the lean and lean Six Sigma space, it's more about eliminating waste in a process. And that's more related to manual processes because you can't make people who are, you know, typing up documents or creating reports, you can't make them do it the exact same way. So you focus on the output and you make sure there's no waste in the journey they get to that output. That was a really okay. good definition. I haven't said it like that before. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, it still sounds kind of, you know, processed in terms of, you know, what that means. But I, I think from knowing you that it also means that you have to kind of pay attention to the people and not just the process. Absolutely. That's how I actually got into this work is um, the company I was working for hired a Six Sigma, Six Sigma Master Black Belt. And um, he asked who in the company had good relationships and got things done. And they said me, and I got partnered up with him. And um, we did what's called the Kaizen event, which is, which is a rapid improvement event for a process. And you pull a couple of people from different business units into a room for a week for like eight to 10 hours a day. And you basically look at your current process and you build a new process together. And so the day before the, he trained me for like two weeks. And, and when I say train, I just mean, we talked about what Six Sigma is and how he learned and what I do and how I'm connected to this, even though I didn't know it, because everywhere I've gone, I've always tried to make things more efficient, um, usually with a fight, but <laughs> <laughs> um, he helped me see that this is like, this comes naturally to me because, you know, the hardest part of this work is getting people to either share their ideas or getting leaders to accept that their people who live in the process every day actually know more than they do. And so we did the Kaizen event and the first day he said, today I do, tomorrow you do, or tomorrow, today I teach and tomorrow you teach. And I was like, what? And so um, we, we co-facilitated that Kaizen event, it was my first one and I hit the ground running and I loved it. And it was like empowering people. And I, I got to see how people can go from like me thinkers and the we thinkers. And they're now thinking about if I don't do this, I'm gonna impact somebody down the line. That's why so-and-so works all night or that's why so-and-so never takes vacation because they're, they always are waiting for somebody to deliver something or they're having to redo something that somebody did wrong. I love it. Take a little bit of that because there's something that happened here that I'm going to probably have to edit out. And so I'm going to ask you to kind of back up to the part where you were talking about, um, you know, you went into a room with people. Oh, okay. So um, we did our first Kaizen event and we pulled uh, a couple of people from the, um, uh, a couple of people from each part of the process, d different business units into a conference room for five days, eight to 10 hours a day. And on the first day, Pete was my boss, Pete Berg. He said, today I teach and tomorrow you do. And I was like, what? And he kind of 
got the ball rolling. Oh, he did give me a book. I will say that. He gave me a book on um, Lean Six Sigma. And I read that book over the weekend. And the second day he said, what are you going to do? And there's this thing called the five whys, which is root cause analysis. And I, he said, what do you want to do today? And I said, I'll do the five whys. And he said, are you sure? And I now know if somebody says, are you sure? I'm going to second, I'm going to second guess whether or not that's the thing I really want to do. But I was like, yeah, how hard could it be? And so I went off to do the five whys and I got to, I, we were getting through stuff doing really well. And then all of a sudden I was on the eighth why. And I was like, uh oh, <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. And the thing I love about him, like he was also my um, best example of a leader because he didn't come over and make me feel bad for making this mistake, right? I told him what happened. And then he excused us, he excused me from the rest of the group that I was working with. And we went out in the hallway. And he said, how'd you get, you know, how'd you get there? And I told him what I did. And he said, okay, so um, next time I say, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I know. And, and then he talked me through how to, okay, so he, he took me out in the hallway and he said, um, how did, how did you get to the eight Y, the eighth Y? And I told him what I was saying and he said, okay, so see, next time I say, are you sure? I was like, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then he helped me course correct. And then I said, well, can you help? Can you show me? And he said, yeah. So we went back in, but he didn't show me like I didn't know what I was doing. Right. He had me get started. And then if I didn't ask the question the right way, he would coach me into how to say it in a different way. So I didn't look stupid at all. Like everybody in the room knew that I, this was my first time doing it, but they, I think they also saw that he was a great leader because of the way that he was coaching me through this. Um, Cause he had everybody evaluate me after that first session and I got really high scores. It was like, I could do this. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how that happened. Okay. So you have, uh quite a history in terms of your life journey and some of that you have uh, found that you discovered uh, your birth family this year and uh, I know that's been quite a process for you. Tell me since you're the 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 love doctor nowadays uh, what have you learned about love through this this new discovery process? Um, so, <clears throat> okay, I hope I can say this without crying. Um, <clears throat> cause actually this is adoption month, um, national adoption month. So two things, one is finding my birth family. I like, I love my mother already because she was like, I found out that she was one of 36 women, black women that were able to adopt as a single parent. And because she was so intentional about wanting a child and raising me the way that she raised me, I always felt like I was from love. Um, and then the way that she told me I was adopted uh, and that my parents gave me to her because they knew she was gonna take really good care of me and they knew she was gonna give me all the love I needed. Um, and I always thought that my mother taught me how to smile and I, I still believe that, but now I know that she taught me how to smile or she made sure I continued to smile, but I got my smile from my dad. Um, and I came from a relationship that was based on love because my parents were in love with each other. They were 16 and in high school, but they were in love. Um, yeah, I got the best parts of both of them. And my mother was the caretaker of those two parts. And she did a great job of taking care to make sure that I continued to be who I came into this world to be and um, gave me the foundation to be like better. I don't know how to say that. How, how yeah, I think- I better. think you said it. Yeah. So you've been going on LinkedIn and other social media with all of these love messages. What prompted that and-, and It froze. You good? Okay. 
Um, yeah, that started with the George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Um, and that's why I said I couldn't, I didn't want to continue posting messages of love unless I could embody, like I had to be able to lead by example and practice what I preached, which I have to say there were times when that was really a challenge. But, but what it also taught me is that we put so much, we give, we give so much nonsense, we give nonsense so much power, right? And if you're looking at life through that lens of love, there's a lot of things that you can just let roll off your back because you recognize that that has nothing to do with you. And if that person had the love that I had in my life, they probably wouldn't act that way. So I can either help them move into a place of love or I can leave them where they are. And that's one of the things that I've learned is that I don't have to fix everybody. <laughs> I can leave them where they are and just pick and choose how I engage. So, yeah. Yet you're involved in a coaching profession now and developing your coaching business. And yet you're giving workshops and um, you're doing a lot of things to help people. Yeah. Um, I think people want to know more about you. Tell us what's coming up. I think you have a workshop coming up. You got a lot of stuff going on and yeah. tell our international audience how they can connect with you. Okay. But I do want to just go back and clarify one thing. Um, when I say leave people where they are, uh, people that want coaching, you know, people come to me for help. And there are times I've had um, coaching clients that I actually had to let go because they weren't really committed to making that change in themselves. But I mean, just I mean, just random people on the street, like dealing with my road rage was one of my things about letting people uh, be where they are. Um, I have a, a webinar coming up right now that's in actually November 16th that's called Do, um, DEI Done Differently. And I have decided that one of the ways that we can move this diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation forward is if maybe we take race out of the conversation for a second so we can create awareness and acceptance so that when we reintroduce race or all the other differences that go in that bucket of diversity and inclusion, um, we can create connectedness and collaboration. So this webinar is kind of in that vein. There's a workshop that follows the webinar. Kind of the workshop is the introduction to this concept. And then there's a three-day workshop that people can sign up for that's based on listening, learning, and leading uh, open-mindedly with vulnerability and uh, empathy, which stands for love. So you get people wondering, you know, how are you going to take race out when race is so intrinsic? Um, I don't want to give anything away, but I can say that race is only as um, important as we make it. Uh, I grew up and my mother made sure that I grew up in a diverse world. And so while I did see the differences in skin tone, and I knew that we were all from different cultures, um, I didn't feel uncomfortable in any of those spaces. I didn't relate to people based on their difference from me. I, I related to them based on what we had in common. Um, my mother took me to fancy restaurants when I was a kid and I'd be uncomfortable because we'd be the only black people in there. And she'd tell me to stop fidgeting and sit up straight. Her words, our money spends green just like theirs. So I grew up in a world where race only mattered if someone, if it mattered to somebody else. So it was usually projected onto me um, rather than me leading through that lens. So I think that there is a way to teach what my mother taught me to other people. Okay. And um, your website is? Glodeinchampion.com. Okay. <laughs> and so the ways that people can reach you are through your website. They can and... reach me through my website or LinkedIn or Facebook oh, and Instagram. And I just found TikTok. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might have a challenge in trying to keep it to 15 seconds. Otherwise, I'm sure it'll be very entertaining. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on Mystic Magic, my friend. I'm so glad to let the world see you through the eyes of Mystic Magic. You have always brought 
a lot of light wherever you are and continue to be a blessing and a creative being and authentically you. So thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives.